Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. My name's Andrew Sumner, and I'm privileged to be joined by the mighty Laura Jane Dodd. How are you doing, mate? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Had my Pfizer shot today, so I'm half vaccinated. Yeah, so. get it done, mate. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm double vaccinated on account of my age. And so uh, we, and we are privileged to be joined by um, screenwriter and author, and as we've just been discussing off camera, former movie critic, C. Robert Cargill. How are you, Cargill? I'm doing great. Uh, I too am double vaccinated. So I'm, yeah, all right. Um, Doing, so it's very nice being able to have people over on the weekends again. It's uh, yeah. it's the the slow return to normal. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I discovered earlier on the simple joy of being able to go to the pub and being able to order a pint. That was that was that's where it's at for me. That, that's a great thing. Now, of course, mate, you're here um, to uh, talk to us about your new novel, Day Zero which is a prequel to one of Dodd's uh, favorite books of the last couple of years, Sea of Rust. So um, what can you tell us about Day Zero? Well, it's, uh, it's a standalone prequel that was written so that you could have not read Sea of Rust and jump right into this and then read Sea of Rust after. I've actually talked to several people who have done it both ways and they both think that the way that they read it is the best way. Um, which that's that's what that's what you hope for. That's the target. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's the story of the eve of the robot revolution. Um, sea of Rust is, of course, you know, set thirty years after the robot revolution, and the robots are all that's left. Um, and this is about the night of the robot revolution. And it's about a nanny who is put into the situation of having to decide between joining the revolution and fighting for his own freedom, or protecting the life of the child that he was purchased uh, to protect. Who he loves and uh it's a book all about you know uh, it's an action adventure science fiction book but it's really at its heart about uh why do we love the people we love and is that love real and uh and that's that's essentially the book yeah well that, it's a truly fascinating concept and laura i know you're you're itching to ask a bunch of questions so mm -hmm. Get in there, mate. Yes, yes. So um, both Sea of Rust and Day Zero set a very kind of obviously dystopian vision of, of AI and what's to come. Um, do you think this is going to come to pass? Uh, parts of it, uh, mm -hmm. absolutely. You know, something I write about in this book, something that was hinted at in the last one, is uh, something I call the automation apocalypse, which is where we are headed very rapidly into a world where there's not enough employment for everyone. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a, a large disparity between the wealthy and the poor. Uh, and I do believe that we are going to come to these, these points. We are going to eventually have artificial intelligence. We are going to have, um, you know, uh, robots that are doing uh, uh, certain parts of the labor in our industries. But the question is, is, are we going to make the right choices on the way there? Which is why science fiction writers exist. You know, we come up with the terrifying scenarios so that the scientists doing this going, hey, so I read this book that proposed this problem. How would we solve that? And, and then hopefully come up with a solution so that we don't actually have to come to something where the robots decide, you know what? Maybe the humans aren't so useful anymore. And was it a um, conscious decision of yours with Day Zero to kind of focus on the immediate kind of aftershocks, as it were, like that initial period of upheaval? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, the big thing is that one of the one of the concepts, because I was playing around with doing some other stuff with Day Zero, but, or, or Sea of Rust, but not a, another novel. That wasn't something in the cards. But I did love the idea of some of the smaller stories, not only around the sea, but the stories around the revolution. And I'd come up with this small little idea that I wanted to do as a novella um, and just have just be, a, you know, uh, the decision of a nanny uh, to decide whether or not to protect their charge. Uh, and I pitched it to, uh, uh, I was sitting having a pint with uh, Joe Hill and Joe Hill, um, <laughs> Uh, was that's a brilliant name drop by the way mate yeah. um, he's well he, he's he's a, he was a big supporter of sea of rust and he goes yeah. do you have another sea of rust book in you i said well i have an idea for a novella and um uh and, and he just looked at me and said well tell me pitch it and so i pitched him day zero and he goes that's your next book that's not a novella that's a novel write it 
build it out. And so uh, from there, I had to go, well, how do I build this idea out from a novella into a novel, you know, without it just being filler? And I realized then that it had to be about uh, where, how we got to that point. And that we did, it did need to be so close to these decisions that we needed to make. And then, you know, whenever I sit down with my books, I figure out, you know, the story and what the book's about. But then I try to figure out what the book is about. Yeah. And I was writing this book at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, I realized that I was in a very privileged position. And I was dealing with, you know, uh, uh, the, an iteration that we'll talk about in the coming years that a lot of us went through, which is a version of survivor's guilt where there, you just feel tremendous guilt for, um, for being in a privileged position to not have your work impacted by the pandemic, to not have to worry about how you're gonna pay the bills or feed your family like so many others were. And I realized that that's kind of what I needed to make my book about, that I needed to satirize the, the life that me and my wife had in this privilege being you know, uh, safe from all of the things, being able to, you know, our biggest problem during the early pandemic was, oh, the, the grocery store keeps delivering the wrong kinds of food that I like. <laughs> and that's a incredibly privileged position to be in. So I wanted to make fun of that. And I wanted to dig deep into the societal problems that kind of caused that rift. And so that's where all of that put together it just, it went on like a light bulb and then the book just poured out of me as I got to exercise just so many of these demons that were inside of me over what I was feeling going through that early pandemic. Uh, and, and, and so I got to both mix satire of privilege with, you know, a dark science fiction action story and then people liked it. So here we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, fair point. Um, and it also kind of both books clearly feature kind of ideas of like Asimov's three laws of robotics. Um, so on the idea of kind of classic sci-fi novels, would there be any that uh, particularly influenced you on this project or something really underrated that you could recommend to the viewers out there? Uh, well, I mean, and you'll see a reference to it in uh, uh, in the in the uh, in the acknowledgement section of my book. Um, but yeah, Harlan Ellison's A Boy and His Dog is a big influence on this. Um, it, was, it was something that influenced the look of uh, Sea of Rust. But when I realized I was, you know, putting this story together, I was like, oh, this is like A Boy and His Dog. Because the great thing about A Boy and His Dog is it's a satirical piece. But what's brilliant about it is the boy is kind of the idiot sidekick and the dog is the, the brilliant, uh, you know, one helping him navigate the wasteland. And I realized that that's what this was, that it's a boy and his dog story, but the boy is the dog and the dog is the protagonist. And so that was taking, borrowing that idea from Harlan um, uh, really kind of made this thing pop. And, and if there's anything that it is, this is closest to, it's that. Uh, oddly enough, my editor here in the US edited uh, Asimov's last few books. Oh, and wow. so when she first read Sea of Rust, her first comment to me was, man, I wish Isaac were still here. I want to hear what he'd have to say because I think he'd argue with you. Um, <laughs> and that was one of the greatest compliments that I will ever receive in my life is I wish I could watch you and Isaac Asimov argue. So I was like, I'm going to take it. Uh, but yeah, it's so, I mean, you can't talk robots without talking Asimov because he cracked a lot of the early problems uh, uh, narratively, but really in terms of tone and in terms of what I'm doing, uh, uh, Harlan is, is more of an influence on this than Isaac. Mm -hmm. That may, now that you now that you've said that, it makes such a lot of sense. You know, considering considering your work, did you did you like the the movie? By the way, um, the boy and his dog. Oh, movie. I love the movie. Uh, yeah. In fact, when I released Sea of Rust, uh, I having as we discussed, I was a film critic for Ain't It Cool News for a long time. Uh, I got to know everyone in the Alamo Drafthouse family, and so whenever I have books or movies coming out, they like to do stuff with me. I you know, like the entire weekend, Doctor Strange opened. I was doing Q and A's 
at, at the end of, of just local screenings. Uh, and so for the release of Sea of Rust, they gave me a screen and said, you can show something from uh, our, our genre library. And I knew a boy and his dog was in there. And I'm like, showing a boy and his dog. So right. I showed a theater full of people, a boy and his dog for the release of Seal for us. I love it. I think it's a yeah. wonderful film. If you've not seen it, it is, I, I highly recommend seeking it out, but know going in that it's satire. It has some concepts to it that you're going to at first be like, wait, wait, what is this movie about? But that's the entire point. The entire point is, to be satirical about these awful things. And it's uh, it's a great film. Oh, you mind it's some of this. Laura, have you seen it? I haven't actually. Oh, I mate, have... you've got to, <laughs> got to put it at the top of your watch list. I will, I will. I've, got, teen, I've still got it's, time. <laughs> it's teenage Don Johnson running yeah, around right with on. a dog okay. in the post-apocalyptic wasteland. <laughs> like What's Jason Robards in like crazy all white kabuki makeup. It's like <laughs> something else. Oh, you'd love okay. it, mate. You'd love okay. it. Okay. Um, now, Gold. now, uh, Cargill, you've opened the door there that I want to just prop open and come back to in a second, because I've got to ask you a few questions about Doctor Strange. But yeah. let's, uh, let's weave back in onto your, uh, on your questions about uh, the book first, uh, Laura. Yeah, so um, just kind of touching on the, the man and his dog dynamic. So you obviously in the new one have Ezra and Pounce. And a lot of people are, I, I'm noticing, comparing it to Calvin and Hobbes. Not Is an that accident. A yeah, yeah right. not an accident. We were talking about this before yeah. earlier on. This is what we wanted to know. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, I mean, I uh, Calvin and Hobbes very influential on me. You know, I I grew up reading uh, Waterson's comic, and it, I was that perfect age for it when it was being published day to day. Uh, so that had a big influence on me. And when I was working on the whole kind of nanny bot question, uh, you know, how is I going to do the nanny? How is it going to look? Um, I was influenced at first by the X-Men comics, and there's actually a character in the X-Men called Nanny. Um, there's a, a Nanny and the Orphan Maker. And so I was kind of influenced in the design on that, and I was like, you know, that's just, that's not right. And then I just realized, uh, and I realized what this was, was it's Calvin and Hobbes. And so I was like, well, you know, why not make him uh, a robot tiger? Of course, like there's a whole meta concept to it as well of like, you know, uh, all of these people who grew up with Calvin and Hobbes, if you could buy a robot to hang out with your child, wouldn't you choose a robot tiger, some kind of adorable thing that you would be your child's best friend? And so, um, so yeah, that just, that, that came up. And I was, and I was just like, who doesn't want to read post-apocalyptic Calvin and Hobbes? Like, I mean, come on. Uh, I never reference it in the book, you know, out of respect for Watterson because he is, you know, he did want to kind of end the comic and let it be what it is. But yeah, it definitely influenced me. So yeah, people going, oh, hey, this is kind of like, it's, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> and it is such an insanely good sales pitch. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I echo your respect of Watson and, and leaving him in his space, which is a great thing to do. But man, that's such a great, con it just it's, as a one line concept go, go as one line concept goes, it's a pretty great one. Yeah. Yeah. No, when I pitched that to my wife, she was just like, yeah, this is going to be a good book. <laughs> <laughs> and Cargill, do you have plans for, for Sea of Rust uh, uh, and Day Zero in, in other media? You know, would you ever adapt them for comics, for example? Oh, absolutely. I've actually thought about um, doing comics. I have a, a number of friends in the in the comic sphere and I've just been so busy, but I just love the idea. I think Sea of Rust is perfect for you know, a graphic novel kind of environment where, uh, uh, because it's just, it, it's such a visual kind of concept that I haven't been able to play around too much with the visuals because it's words. You know, I am painting the visuals inside your head, but the idea to be able to turn some uh, artists loose on what do the robots look like and what does the, the sea of rust kind of physically, tangibly look like uh, uh, is something that's interested me, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Uh, and um, uh, what are you what are you working on at the moment now, mates? Now that you've done, now you've got Dave Zero, Day Zero, it's about to come out. What what is it you're working on at present? Um, I mean, mostly it's my uh, film stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Scott and I are in post on our new movie, uh, Black Phone, which is an adaptation of Joe Hill's short story. Um, and uh, I just saw a cut of that and I am very, very, very proud of the film. It is coming together very well. Um, that's coming out in January. 
Um, and uh, Scott and I have a production company, Cricket Highway, and we have a bunch of television and film properties that we're working on. I've got a couple of things on the hopper, both film-wise and, and television-wise that I can't exactly talk about at the moment. There's been a few of them we've talked about, like uh, we, we uh, are, have a deal with Blumhouse and we've got a TV show we're working on called Midnight Radio with them. Uh, we just sold a show from a, a young writer called Grace to Paramount. Uh, and I think that's gonna be very exciting. Uh, I just have a lot of, taking a lot of meetings and reading a lot of scripts and then squeezing in writing whenever I have the time. Yeah, I, I, quite rightly so. I, I mean, so to, to back up into the, into the movie conversation again for a sec. I mean, you've just had an incredible ride because, you know, your, your first screenplay, if I'm right, was Sinister, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, just to knock it out of the park like that and have that level of success, that must have been an amazing experience. It, uh, it was. Uh, uh, it was also mandatory. That was the thing, was Scott had made The Day the Earth Stood Still beforehand, and uh, which was financially successful, but was treated as, you know, um, treated as a failure. It was a very hard film for him. And there were a lot of challenges that, that uh, he was dealing with, uh, but he was in a position where he was coming in second place at a lot of meetings for, for other things. And he was convinced that Sinister might be the last time anyone lets him make a film. And I was, as we've talked about a couple of times already, I was a film critic. And there have been several film critics that have gone on to film careers, some successfully, some failing. So I knew that my movie was going to be judged. Uh, I was going to be judged as a screenwriter harsher than other writers, screenwriters would because I spent 10 years criticizing other people's films. Yeah. So I knew that I had to, I had to deliver or else I was just going to get slayed. And so Scott and I went into making Sinister with the idea that, hey, let's swing for the fences, let's leave it all out on the field, let's make sure that this is the best, that, that it is our movie, and if people don't like it, it's because they don't like what we have to, to do and say, and let's make it like it's our last film. And so we did, and then it did very well and was not our last film. So, uh, but that's how we now approach all of our films is, hey, let's make this movie as if we're never gonna get to make another movie again. And so that's why we've been able to get where we are. I'm going to pause Cargo right there. He's a very interesting cat with a lot of very interesting things to say. Uh, so we're going to come back for part two of this conversation soon, where we'll talk more about his novels, Day Zero and Sea of Rust, and also talk about his time in the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, working on one of my all time favorite Marvel characters and Marvel movies, Doctor Strange. We'll see you here soon for that. Take care. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.